when generations of people like you decided we're not going to be passive, we're going to be active, decided that we're going to truly gise, right, and awake. So in response to the exploitation of Filipino farm workers, actually, so people actually, you know, by the 1960s, it was still a problem. You still saw Filipino workers and Mexican workers more and more now working in the fields, working in terrible conditions, and students were saying, you know, this is, a, this is, this is outrageous. This is a problem. We want to support workers in their struggles. So students got very active in supporting workers' uh, unionization efforts, right? But also they started to see, you know what, this is not just an issue of, uh, of workers. Right? On our college campuses, we are invisible. Right? So the 1960s, were, uh, students got together in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also here in Davis, and they formed the Third World Liberation Front. And so basically, they went on strike. Um, many of the strikers, uh, the de demands of the strikers were basically uh, several fold. One was they said, look, we need to have more admissions of people like us to the university, right? So that was one of their main demands. That there had to be admission for greater numbers of, of students of color into uh, college campuses. Um, two, they demanded that there be the introduction of courses that reflected their experiences, right? That reflected the experiences of students of color and provide them the skills to be able to assist their communities. Another kind of um, demand that these, these student activists had was around the fact that this idea that the university should be really controlled by communities, right? It's not, it shouldn't be just in the hands of administrators who have no connection to our communities, but we should have some kind of community control. And so this becomes important because when you see even the founding of your organization, Mga Kapatid, right? MK member and officer, yeah? When was it started? When was MK started? 1969, right? 1969, crucial year, because in the 1968, 1969, students, minority students, students of color were recognizing that they had to organize themselves, right? That they had to really assert their collective identities to make sure that college campuses reflected, right, the demographics of the state, reflected their experiences, right? So I, I say this, and when we talk about the present, because I think we're in a moment now where we can't take our institutions for granted at all, right? Um, you can't really see this, but it's a really, really, it's a archive, it's from the archives of the Third World Liberation Front. So one of the key actors in the Third World Liberation Front was actually the, the Philippine American Collegiate Endeavor, or PACE, from San Francisco State. And so um, it talks just really briefly, right? It says here, we the Filipinos have come to the realization along with our third world brothers that the struggle for self-determination is the struggle of all third world people, peoples, right? And so it just talks about kind of, um, and then, you know, it says here one, there, should, there will be established in the School of Ethnic Studies Department of Filipino Studies. That's what they demanded. No, we didn't really get that. Uh, but we did get Filipino faculty. Um, and that within this department, individuals comprise, you know, uh, who comprise the Department of Filipino Studies will have complete control of its business, et cetera, et cetera, right? That any Filipino who desires to go to the college will be admitted in the fall of 1969. Pretty radical demands, you yeah? know? The Filipinos didn't necessarily get all of them at their demands, uh, but they made these demands and certain concessions were made, and that's really, really crucial uh, for us. Because, again, many of the institutions that you now are taking for granted Right, come out of these struggles. Right, so the the Third World Liberation Front happened in the Bay Area, and Davis students were inspired too. Right, in 1969, 23 uh, students actually lobbied for Asian American Studies right here in Davis. Right, um, and again, this is the same year that MK gets gets formed. Right, so we need to, to see these connections between the things we now take for granted. Right, and these earlier, these earlier uh, sorts of struggles. Right, but even my own, the very possibility for me to stand here before you today comes out of that. Right, I, for several years you haven't even had a Filipino um, studies or Filipino American studies faculty. Right, and, and actually at UC Berkeley, it took them 30 years. It took them 30 years to be able to finally hire a Filipino American studies faculty after having um, an Asian American studies department for, their, for that that many several decades, right? So it comes from um, this kinds of history. So again, 
to, to get to my, my main point. Right? How do we get from wake as a noun to wake as a verb? How are we going to relate to our heritage in an active and not a passive way? How are we going to relate to our history so that we're not just sitting and watching, but that we are roused to act? And, and the, the fact is that we can't be caught sleeping, especially now. We cannot be caught sleeping, especially now, because there are many, many signs that the quote that I started with today, right, the quote of Carlos Bulosan, that is a crime to be a Filipino in California, a lot of that still rings true even now in the early 20th century, 21st century, right? The, uh, the condition of the Filipino in the early 21st, 20th century is very similar to the one that we have even now in the 21st. Um, the games of the 1960s, for instance, right? In just a few, set, a few decades, a lot of that was rolled back. When I was in college um, in the 1990s, affirmative action programs were being eliminated programs that had come out of these struggles in the 1960s. As a result, Filipino enrollments in the UCs dropped dramatically. Um, so there was a proposition in the 1990s called Proposition 209 that eliminated these, that took away these affirmative action programs in California. And after its passage, you know, that no Filipinos were enrolled in UC Berkeley's very prestigious Bolt Law School after that. Um, this visible absence of Filipinos in the state's most prestigious institutions just became so apparent. And we still see that, right? We still see our numbers declining um, in many of the institutions across the UCs, right? Now that we're in this moment of fiscal crisis, right? This is going, this is huge. One wonders what is going to be considered by the University of California or the University of California Chancellor, what's going to be considered essential versus not essential, right? When budgets get debated, are they going to say, well, we don't need all of these Filipino organizations. Why have so many? Why don't you consolidate, right? Too much of our, budge, our, our, our budget you know, goes to these kinds of things <coughs> that need to be freed up. That can be an argument that, that can be made, right? It certainly gets made in different kinds of forms and uh, around other sorts of programs. Like what about in Asian American studies? Will it be considered a non-essential kind of department? Right? Even though I got hired this year, and Professor C also got hired, at what point does it be considered, is this Asian American Studies, if we are caught sleeping, considered non-essential, right? It's not core to a, uh, to a, a, a university education in the 21st century. Why take these courses? What do they do? You can't do anything with it when you graduate, right? What does it get you when you take a Filipino American Studies course? Are you going to get a job from this? What? You're going to major in Asian American Studies? Tell your parents at home, and in this economy, no, right? Will the university buy, or maybe think that these kinds of programs are, are, are just not relevant? Perhaps, right? We're in a moment where these kinds of questions may, can and may be asked, right? And again, if we're caught sleeping, where are we going to be left? Um, not only we're dealing with uh, sort of fiscal crisis and how it affects our universities, I mean, you all know it too in terms of just how it feels in terms of having to pay such exorbitant tuition fees, right? It's getting expensive. So we already have a situation for, where you don't have a lot of Filipinos coming to the university, right? For a whole variety of reasons, because public education is problematic for our communities. I mean, Bridge can tell you all this, right? They go, when you go, if you go with Bridge and you volunteer as an intern, you're gonna see people in our community who really have it hard up. They go to schools that aren't so great, make it difficult to get to college. And those of you who make it to college, it's so incredibly expensive to stay here, right? So that's just at the college level. But <laughs> step back and look at our community more broadly, this fiscal crisis can and is generating all sorts of, of anti-immigrant sentiment, right? In our communities, we see stepped up immigration enforcement, right? People are getting deported. Now, a lot of this comes in the wake of 9-11. Right? After 9-11, basically, the United States really beefed up its immigration enforcement. And so you're seeing these massive sort of raids in different, uh, around the country. Right? And they come in very, very different forms. But you're seeing many, many people in our community being targeted for detention and deportation. Right? We have a lot of people who are, in fact, undocumented. Right? We don't often talk about, um, and this is just something uh, this shows 
It's a really complicated sort of figure. But actually, it just goes to show the various pathways by which Filipinos can get deported. Um, and actually, basically, even if you're a green card holder, you can't be so certain that your, your legal status will always be secure nowadays. You can easily go from legal to illegal very quickly, right? The boundary between legal and illegal in this moment is very, very, very unclear. You can slip. You can slip very easily. Right? And this is a condition that uh, many people in our community are facing, in part because why? There continues to be crisis in the Philippines. There are still all of these pushback, as I talk about that a lot in my, my research, in my book. Right? All of these pressures in the Philippines that are pushing people out, They're pushing people out to come to the United States, pushing them to go around the world. Right? You all probably have a relative in some mm -hmm. other country other than the United States. Raise your hand if that's true. You have a relative in Saudi, Hong Kong, Japan, right? Uh, Kuwait, everybody here practically. So you have these kinds of pressures in the Philippines. And so what do Filipinos do? Well, they come here and they come here illegally. What is, but we don't cross the border, although some of us do. I actually have a tita who went to Mexico and crossed the border um, that way. But there are actually Filipinos who will come as tourists, right? Because they want to join their families because it takes so long to, to reunite with their families under current immigration law. And then they just make those visas lapse, right? How, how many of you have no family members who've done that? They're tourists. But they're actually really not tourists. They really intended to stay here for a little bit, right? <laughs> Raise your hands. You know it, right? Mm -hmm. This is an experience of our community. Why? Because if, if you've ever paid attention, like when you try to bring a family member from the Philippines, it takes a really long time, right? Some, somebody's uh, nodding their head. Does anybody have an experience of like your parents maybe sponsoring mm -hmm. your uncle and it took a really long time? Everybody's, yeah, right? 